The Custom House, Introductory to The Scarlet Letter It is a little remarkable that, though disinclined to talk over much of myself and my affairs at a fireside and to my personal friends, an autobiographical impulse should twice in my life have taken possession of me in addressing the public. The first time was three or four years since, when I favoured the reader, inexcusably and for no earthly reason that either the indulgent reader or the intrusive author could imagine, with a description of my way of life in the deep quietude of an old manse. And now, because beyond my deserts I was happy enough to find a listener or two on the former occasion, I again seize the public by the button and talk of my three years' experience in a custom house. The example of the famous P.P. clerk of this parish was never more faithfully followed. The truth seems to be, however, that when he casts his leaves forth upon the wind, the author addresses not the many who will fling aside his volume, or never take it up, but the few who will understand him better than most of his schoolmates and life-mates. Some authors indeed do far more than this, and indulge themselves in such confidential depths of revelation as could fittingly be addressed only and exclusively to the one heart and mind of perfect sympathy, as if the printed book thrown at large on the wide world were certain to find out the divided segment of the writer's own nature, and complete his circle of existence by bringing him into communion with it. It is scarcely decorous, however, to speak all even where we speak impersonally. But, as thoughts are frozen and utterance benumbed, unless the speaker stand in some true relation with his audience, it may be pardonable to imagine that a friend, a kind and apprehensive, though not the closest friend, is listening to our talk. And then, a native reserve being thawed by this genial consciousness, we may pray to the circumstances that lie around us, and even of ourselves, but still keep the inmost me behind its veil. To this extent, and within these limits, an author, methinks, may be autobiographical, without violating either the reader's rights or his own. It will be seen, likewise, that this custom-house sketch has a certain propriety of a kind always recognized in literature as explaining how a large portion of the following pages came into my possession, and as offering proofs of the authenticity of a narrative therein contained. This, in fact, a desire to put myself in my true position as editor, or very little more, of the most prolix among the tales that make up my volume, this, and no other, is my true reason for assuming a personal relation with the public. In accomplishing the main purpose, it has appeared allowable, by a few extra touches, to give a faint representation of a mode of life not heretofore described, together with some of the characters that move in it, among whom the author happened to make one. In my native town of Salem, at the head of what, half a century ago in the days of old King Derby, was a bustling wharf, but which is now burdened with decayed wooden warehouses and exhibits few or no symptoms of commercial life, except perhaps a bark or brig halfway down its melancholy length discharging hides, or nearer at hand a Nova Scotia schooner pitching out her cargo of firewood, at the head, I say, of this dilapidated wharf, which the tide often overflows, and along which, at the base and in the rear of the row of buildings, the track of many languid years is seen in a border of unthrifty grass, here, with a view from its front windows adown this not very enlivening prospect, and thence across the harbour, stands a spacious edifice of brick." From the loftiest point of its roof, during precisely three and a half hours of each forenoon, floats, or droops in breeze or calm, the banner of the Republic, but with the thirteen stripes turned vertically instead of horizontally, and thus indicating that a civil and not a military post of Uncle Sam's government is here established. Its front is ornamented with a portico of half a dozen wooden pillars, supporting a balcony, beneath which a flight of wide granite steps descends towards the street. Over the entrance hovers an enormous specimen of the American eagle, with outspread wings, a shield before her breast, and, if I recollect aright, a bunch of intermingled thunderbolts and barbed arrows in each claw. 
With the customary infirmity of temper that characterizes this unhappy fowl, she appears by the fierceness of her beak and eye and the general truculency of her attitude to threaten mischief to the inoffensive community, and especially to warn all citizens, careful of their safety, against intruding on the premises which she overshadows with her wings. Nevertheless, vixenly as she looks, Many people are seeking at this very moment to shelter themselves under the wing of the Federal Eagle, imagining, I presume, that her bosom has all the softness and snugness of an eider-down pillow. But she has no great tenderness, even in her best of moods, and sooner or later, oftener soon than late, is apt to fling off her nestlings with a scratch of her claw, a dab of her beak, or a rankling wound from her barbed arrows. The pavement round about the above-described edifice, which we may as well name at once as the custom-house of the port, has grass enough growing in its chinks to show that it has not of late days been. In some months of the year, however, there are often chances of forenoon when affairs move onward with a livelier tread. Such occasions might remind the elderly citizen of that period before the last war with England when Salem was a port by itself not scorned as she is now by her own merchants and ship-owners, who permit her wars to crumble to ruin while their ventures go to swell needlessly and imperceptibly the mighty flood of commerce at New York or Boston. On some such morning, when three or four vessels happen to have arrived at once, usually from Africa or South America, or to be on the verge of their departure thitherward, there is a sound of frequent feet passing briskly up and down the granite steps. Here, before his own wife has greeted him, you may greet the sea-flushed shipmaster, just in port, with his vessel's papers under his arm in a tarnished tin box. Here, too, comes his owner, cheerful or somber, gracious or in the sulks, accordingly as his scheme of the now-accomplished voyage has been realized in merchandise that will readily be turned to gold, or has buried him under a bulk of incommodities, such as nobody will care to rid him of. Here, likewise, the germ of the wrinkle-browed, grisly-bearded, careworn merchant, we have the smart young clerk, who gets the taste of traffic as a wolf-cub does of blood, and already sends adventures in his master's ships, when he had better be sailing mimic boats upon a mill-pond. Another figure in the scene is the outward-bound sailor, in quest of a protection, or the recently arrived one, pale and feeble, seeking a passport to the hospital. Nor must we forget the captains of the rusty little schooners that bring firewood from the British provinces. A rough-looking set of tarpaulins, without the alertness of the Yankee aspect, but contributing an item of no slight importance to our decaying trade. Cluster all these individuals together, as they sometimes were, with other miscellaneous ones to diversify the group, and, for the time being, it made the Custom House a stirring scene. More frequently, however, on ascending the steps you would discern, in the entry if it were summertime or in their appropriate rooms if wintry or inclement weather, a row of venerable figures, sitting in old-fashioned chairs which were tipped on their hind legs back against the wall. Oftentimes they were asleep, but occasionally might be heard talking together in voices between speech and a snore, and with that lack of energy that distinguishes the occupants of almshouses and all other human beings who depend for subsistence on charity, on monopolized labor, or anything else but their own independent exertions. These old gentlemen, seated like Matthew at the receipt of custom, but not very liable to be summoned thence, like him for apostolic errands, were custom-house officers. Furthermore, on the left hand, as you enter the front door, is a certain room or office about fifteen feet square and of a lofty height, with two of its arched windows commanding a view of the aforesaid dilapidated wharf, and the third looking across a narrow lane and along a portion of Derby Street. All three give glimpses of the shops of grocers, block-makers, slop-sellers, and ship-chandlers around the doors of which are generally to be seen, laughing and gossiping, clusters of old salts and such other wharf-rats as haunt the whopping of a seaport. The room itself is cobwebbed and dingy with old paint. Its floor is strewn with grey sand, in a fashion that has elsewhere fallen into long disuse, 
and it is easy to conclude from the general slovenliness of the place that this is a sanctuary into which womankind, with her tools of magic, the broom and mop, has very infrequent access. In the way of furniture, there is a stove with a voluminous funnel, an old pine desk with a three-legged stool beside it, two or three wooden-bottomed chairs, exceedingly decrepit and infirm, and, not to forget the library, on some shelves a score or two of volumes of the Acts of Congress and a bulky digest of the revenue laws. A tin pipe ascends through the ceiling and forms a medium of vocal communication with other parts of the edifice, and here, some six months ago, pacing from corner to corner or lounging on the long-legged stool with his elbow on the desk and his eyes wandering up and down the columns of the morning newspaper, you might have recognized, honored reader, the same individual who welcomed you into his cheery little study where the sunshine glimmered so pleasantly through the willow branches on the western side of the old mount. But now, should you go thither to seek him, you would inquire in vain for the loco foco surveyor. The besom of reform has swept him out of office, and a worthier successor wears his dignity and pockets his emoluments. This old town of Salem, my native place, though I have dwelt much away from it both in boyhood and maturer years, possesses or did possess, a hold on my affections, the force of which I have never realized during my seasons of actual residence here. Indeed, so far as its physical aspect is concerned, with its flat, unvaried surface, covered chiefly with wooden houses, few or none of which pretend to architectural beauty, its irregularity, which is neither picturesque nor quaint, but only tame, its long and lazy street lounging wearisomely through the whole extent of the peninsula, with Gallows Hill and New Guinea at one end, and a view of the Alms House at the other, such being the features of my native town, it would be quite as reasonable to form a sentimental attachment to a disarranged checkerboard. And yet, though invariably happiest elsewhere, there is within me a feeling for old Salem which, in lack of a better phrase, I must be content to call affection. The sentiment is probably assignable to the deep and aged root which my family has struck into the soil. It is now nearly two centuries and a quarter since the original Briton, the earliest emigrant of my name, made his appearance in the wild and forest-bordered settlement which has since become a city. And here his descendants have been born and died, and have mingled their earthy substance with the soil, until no small portion of it must necessarily be akin to the mortal frame wherewith, for a little while, I walk the streets. In part, therefore, the attachment which I speak of is the mere sensuous sympathy of dust for dust. Few of my countrymen can know what it is, nor, as frequent transplantation is perhaps better for the stock, need they consider it desirable to know.